Good morning. Good to see you all here today. At this moment, what I'd like to do, we've got a little different order of service. I want to invite you now to come to the altar right this moment to pray with me as we pray for our service today. And just thank the Lord for allowing us to be here. So if you'll please join me here, I would appreciate it. Father, we are grateful that you have allowed us to be here this morning. We thank you for this weekend and what it represents. It's not about barbecues. It's not about family. But it's about honoring those who have given the ultimate sacrifice. We thank you for what they have done. We thank you for their service. And Father, as we think about those that have given their lives, we must remember the Lord Jesus who served us so well, who laid down his life for his friends that we could be forgiven of our sins. We thank you that not only did he die, but he arose again that third day to give us true freedom. Lord, I pray that as we assemble this morning that uh, your Holy Spirit would give us a, uh, a new heart and a new spirit. That you take away our stony, stubborn heart, Lord, and give us a tender, responsive heart, a tender, responsive spirit. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do this morning in our services. We praise you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> If you would, would you stand with me as we sing together? We are such a blessed nation, such a blessed people, and we give the Lord all the praise, glory, and honor. Let's give Him thanks this morning as we sing. Let's sing. grateful heart give thanks to the Holy One give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son give thanks with the grateful heart give thanks to the Holy One give thanks He's given Jesus Christ His Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us.
this morning for all he's done. Let's remain standing. Let's repeat our memory verse for this past week, our month. Let's repeat together. For our struggle, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the power of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 6, 12. Sonny, would you mind leave this, please? Let's show me, Father, thank you for this day. Father, thank you for this holiday weekend. And as we speak of freedom and sacrifice, Father, help us to remember the, the ultimate sacrifice with your Son, Jesus Christ, and the freedom that he gave us through death on the cross. Father, thank you so much for this portion of our service. Help us to spread your word through the tithe and offering. In your gracious Son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would, let's stand together. Let's sing, My Country, Tis of Thee.
this is Memorial Day and we come this morning to remember the red in the flags in the flag reminds us of the blood that was shed over years and years ago that we could be here today to have freedom in our land and we want to remember right now and we want to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America attention salute pledge I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's take this time right now as we remember, as we present the task.
say amen. You think about what we have been given as a country. We are certainly blessed uh, beyond measure. Um, you saw a little preview, a video I'm going to show in just a second. But um, uh, I want you to, I really believe this with all my heart, that when I see a veteran or I see someone who is currently serving, and think about those who have served and given the ultimate sacrifice, I see them as a hero. That's what I see. Let me turn the lights down a little bit. <clears throat> I love seeing things click in my son's head. It's taken the better part of the last nine years to master the art of catching this elusive microscopic moment. The instant he realized where hamburgers and his little sister came from have been among the most enjoyable. Third grade has taught Hudson a lot about the roots of our country. So when a business trip sent me to DC recently, I thought it was the perfect opportunity for a father-son trip and for me to watch all the little dots connect in his head about what he'd been learning in school. We saw where the very first president lived. We came all the way out here for this. And we saw where the president lives today. son taught me what he'd learned in school about the men who framed our country. And I taught my son about the men and women who are still shaping our country today. And that's why the legislative branch is broken into two different sections. Yeah, but why do they argue so much? We walked in the footsteps of countless men and women who stood up for their rights. And we sat at the feet of the great emancipator, who to this day still sits vigilant over all of our rights. He's a lot bigger in person. Uh-huh. I've been looking for those clicks, those aha moments. But my son surprised me. He had it all pretty well figured out. But we still had one place left to visit. What are these, Dad? These are our heroes, son. What kind of heroes? These are the heroes that made possible everything you and I saw today. These are American heroes, son. Is that a hero, Dad? Click. Yeah, that's a hero. Can we go get pizza now? Those moments never last as long as a father would like. The day I pray that the families of these fallen can somehow feel the goodness of God amidst their loss. Come on, Dad, I've been waiting forever. Okay, let's go. It is because of the sacrifices of our heroes that I have the freedom to experience moments like this. So to all the men, women, and families of those who served in the armed forces, thank you for your sacrifice. You will never be forgotten. I say a double amen to that. You know, God has blessed our country in so many ways. Just think for a moment of this freedom we have. Um, we're free to worship. Uh, we're free to say what we desire. 
We're very prosperous as a country, and we have opportunities that so many across the world don't have. And God has raised up men and women that have made it all possible. Now, this is not just uh, not something that I think just for this weekend, but every day I am thankful for those who have served in our military. Uh, each person that serves has been and is willing to lay down their lives for our sake. For, we, for that we are grateful. And I would say this, I thank you, I thank them, and I thank the Lord. And I want to show uh, the reason we've done what we've done, we want to show our appreciation. But also we want to thank God because uh, when you think about uh, those who have sacrificed, no one has sacrificed like Jesus. The scripture says there's no greater love than this than for one to lay down his life for his friends. And that's certainly what Jesus has done. And because of those who have laid down their lives for us, we have the privilege to gather to worship with the freedom and not being worried about being arrested. We can proclaim that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. We have the freedom to teach what Jesus taught. And that brings us to where we are today in Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 17, where we left off last week. But I want to talk this morning about uh, surrendering our security blanket. And um, we're in week two as we uh, look at Mark chapter 10. We've been talking about uh, life principles. We've been talking about rules for the road that we're on. And I declare to you that in Jesus we find what is essential and we find what we must do. And a little quick reminder of last week what we talked about, what Jesus said. He said this in verse 15. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter in. Now how does, a, how does a child receive the kingdom of God? Well, a child does so in, in total dependence and in complete humility. And, will, and I'll say this, that as a Christian, we will never reach the stage in life where we no longer need God's grace to sustain us. In this way, we must be like little children humble and completely dependent upon him. So the road rule last week was this, life with God or salvation is a gift that is to be received, it is to be enjoyed, it is to be explored with the gracious enthusiasm of a child. Now this morning we're going to build on that principle that we started last week and we're going to look at the story of the rich young ruler. And uh, the story appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke and Matthew refers to him, him as young. Luke refers to him as a ruler and all three of them refer to him as rich. Thus we get the story we call the rich young ruler. So I want to pray, though, before I read part of the text. So uh, let's pray together. Ask the Lord to uh, quicken our hearts, to speak to us. Lord, we thank you so much for today, and uh, we thank you for your word that we can read. And Lord, in just a moment, we're going to stand in honor of your infallible word. We're going to read about a conversation that the Savior, the Lord Jesus, had with this rich, young ruler. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts. I pray that we would have uh, open ears and that we would accept that we would agree with your truth. Lord, I pray for myself that you would cleanse me of my sin and that, Lord, that in me there would be no hindrance but that your spirit would flow freely in this place. I pray, Lord, that you would visit each pew, each individual, and that, Lord, as a result of being in your presence, that, Lord, we would be changed. Help us this morning to surrender our security blankets. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. 
If you will, please stand with me as I'll be reading it starting in verse 17. I'm going to read just part, and then we'll talk about this. I'll read some more, but uh, starting in verse number 17 through verse number 23. It says this, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, <clears throat> do, not bear, <clears throat> do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. <clears throat> Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. May God add his blessing to the reading. You may be seated. <clears throat> You know, this morning I want to make just a couple of observations about this story, uh, about how we can apply it to our lives. And the first observation is this, that emotion is not enough. <clears throat> There's got to be so much more than emotion, or you could say this, <clears throat> a flurry of emotion isn't enough to sustain spiritual life. Now, how did this man, <clears throat> how does the Bible say this man came to Jesus? The Bible says that he ran into his presence, and it says that he fell at his, on his knees, and then he, uh, he flattered him with uh, saying, good teacher, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And uh, it seems, seems like a, a great beginning there, uh, full of all kinds of emotion, but as we will see, it was a beginning without any substance. This man, this rich young ruler, uh, seemed very sincere. He was actually, I believe, salvation shopping. He did not come to Jesus saying, I surrender all. He did not come as a little child. He came and said, uh, what must I do? Uh, what can I do to uh, inherit? What is, uh, what is something that I can uh, manufacture myself? What are the minimum requirements for this work, this salvation, eternal life, to work in my life? What's the best price that you have? And I'm afraid that there are many across this great land that approach Jesus with the exact same mindset, what is the minimum that I must do in order to be saved? This man, this rich young ruler, gave a great first impression. He ran with excitement. He fell at his feet before Jesus and then flattered him with some words. And I, I learned this uh, at uh, going to detention centers to, to, to share God's word. I've learned this, that there is a difference <clears throat> between jailhouse religion and outside religion. And I'll make it a step further. There is a difference from church house religion and outside these four walls religion. I'm afraid that oftentimes there are those who have this, this range of emotion and they come and they fall at Jesus' feet and they have all these flattering words but it's just a first impression and I'm afraid that it happens all too often every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. There's a difference between in here and out there. My friends, I declare to you today that there should be no difference. What we are in here, we should be out there. And what we are out there is really and truly what we are in here. Now, this man, he came and he ran. 
And he fell at the feet of Jesus. And uh, uh, my friends, what this tells me is, as we read the story and know what Jesus said, that the Christian life following Jesus is much deeper than a first impression. It's much deeper than a show of emotion. And it's much deeper than the surface level respectability. The second observation that I see in this text is that Jesus can't be fooled. <clears throat> You may fool everybody else, but you will never fool Jesus. Jesus cannot be fooled with insincere religious talk. This man, he came to Jesus and refers to him as good teacher. Now, no doubt, he expected Jesus to respond with the custom of that day in equally respectful terms and respond back to him and say, most honored and good sir. But instead, note what Jesus said. He said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, was Jesus, uh, was he saying that he wasn't God? Was he saying that he wasn't good? Of course he wasn't saying those things. In fact, he was simply saying, he, he did not say, don't call me good. He said, why do you call me good? It's almost as if he were saying is, do you really know who you're talking to? Are you just calling me good with, uh, 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 I guess you'd say, uh, or do you believe that I am the Messiah? Or is this just smooth talk so you can have respectability? Now, the temptation of many, I believe, is to politely dismiss Jesus as a good man. There are many who want to dismiss him as a great teacher or an outspoken prophet or a brilliant thinker above, uh, beyond his time. But all of those labels that I just mentioned are all inadequate. Jesus claimed to be so much more. More than a good teacher, more than a good prophet, more than a brilliant thinker, Jesus proclaimed to be the Son of God. He proclaimed to be the Messiah. He proclaimed to be the only way of salvation. He proclaimed that He alone had power to forgive sins. He proclaimed that He existed before eternity. He proclaimed that He was equal to God. Someone who makes that type of claim, as C.S. Lewis would said, is either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. He's one of the three. Someone who claims to be God and someone who claims to, uh, claims to be going to heaven to build mansions for his followers cannot be dismissed as just a good man or a good teacher. Now, how do we know that Jesus was telling the truth. That he was the Messiah. He was the Son of God. He was equal to God. He is the only way to God the Father. How, how do we know that he told the truth? My friends, it, we know he told the truth because he is the only one who's ever conquered death. The only one. It was a Friday afternoon. Uh, they put his lifeless body in a, a cold, dark tomb, and uh, it appeared that it was all over. But on that third day, the breath of God entered into his lungs. The blood began to flow through his veins. He opened his eyes, and he stood to his feet in resurrection power, and he was not just a good teacher. He was God in the flesh. He arose that third day. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. Thus, he proved that everything he said was accurate. Now, let's look at the story. It goes on in verse 21. It says, Jesus looked at this man, this rich young ruler, who came and slid at his feet and said, Good teacher, what must I do? And he says, he looked at him and he said to this rich young ruler, One thing you lack. Notice the next phrase. Jesus said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. The Bible says, at this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around at his disciples. Uh, he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. 
The disciples, it says, were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Some translations in verse 23 say, How hard it is for those who trust in riches. Jesus goes on to say, he says, It is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples uh, were even more amazed, it says, and said, Then who then can be saved? Another observation that I see in our text is that love speaks what's necessary. <clears throat> Mark points out, as I read, that Jesus looked at this man and loved him. Now, it wasn't that Jesus didn't care for him. It says he looked at him and loved him. And my friends, no matter how much you love someone, it does not change the truth. It doesn't change what is necessary. This man came to Jesus wanting to negotiate the terms of salvation. And my friends, <clears throat> I'm here to tell you that the terms of salvation are non-negotiable. Jesus is the way. And he came to Jesus uh, saying, give me something that I can do. Something along the lines that I'm already doing. I'm willing to do that much, a little bit more there. I'll try a little bit harder. I might even give a greater percentage of my income to the temple. But Jesus said, in effect, that's not how it works. You don't inherit eternal life when you've completed the checklist. My friends, you receive eternal life when you surrender to God everything that is dear to you. Another observation that I see in our text is that an attachment to money can ruin your life. An attachment to money can ruin your life. It's right there in the text. Jesus doesn't pull any punches when it comes to wealth. He says how hard it is for, a, for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. He says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now when we hear rich man, what do we think of? I know in my mind I think of, I think of Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, or maybe the plumber. <laughs> Make such a great wage. You know, we, that's who we think of, those who have all kinds of, of money. And the truth is, actually, compared to the rest of the world, everybody in this room is really wealthy. And I would say extremely wealthy. However, it's not a question about how much money you have in the checkbook or in the savings account. It's a question of whether or not you trust in your riches. It's a question of whether you would rather be financially secure or eternally secure. You know, Jesus, he had a lot to say about money, and it wasn't much good. In fact, Jesus talked a lot about the destructive nature of wealth, and that's because people can easily allow themselves to be seduced by the lure of things to the point that they abandon their spiritual principles. William, William Barclay, scholar, he, he tells a story about an 18th century poet named Samuel Johnson. He said that Dr. Johnson was being shown around a, a lavish castle in the estate, and he turned to those who were with him and said, these, talk about the castle and all the stuff, these are the things that make it difficult to die. You ever felt that way? I can't wait to go to heaven, but I want to do this first. Where's your love? Think about that. Or, or maybe, maybe this. Uh, here's a, a fictitious way to think about this. Uh, I love my car so much. I don't want to lose it. I want to take it to heaven. I want to see what it will do on the streets of gold. That's fictitious. Possessions and the desire for more have a way of gripping your soul and distorting your values to the point to where you think, if I own just a few more toys, if I can just get that bigger house or that newer car or that boat or motorcycle or camp or new computer or new phone or that side-by-side -side or that retirement home at the beach, 
If I can just get just a little bit more, I'll be happy. Or we get to the point where we think that getting a check at the end of each month with enough numbers on it, then I'll really be living and I'll be happy. Now listen to what the Bible says in Proverbs. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. It goes on to say, be wise enough to know when to quit. In the blink of an eye, wealth disappears. For it will spring wings and fly away like an eagle. See, the lure of money and the desire for more always has a way of giving you a false security. And we're tempted to think this. Uh, if I only had enough, if I had enough steady stream of cash coming in, I would be so happy and all the, my problems would be solved and they would just be dis, they would disappear. And we think this. If I only had enough savings... If I only had enough retirement, if I, had, I only had enough in my checking account or my 401k, if I only had enough there, uh, things would be better. Now here's my question. How much is enough? Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, be on guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of of his possessions. When people look at this story of the rich young ruler, uh, they, they come to a natural uh, uh, question. They think this, does God expect me to give up everything and become poor? No, he does not. That requirement's nowhere found really in Scripture at all. In fact, think about the story of Zacchaeus, the, the wee little man up in the sycamore tree, and uh, he just happened to be a rich tax collector. And when Jesus, when he, when he decided to follow Jesus, uh, what did he say? He said, here, I give half of my possessions to the poor. Now, what did Jesus say when he made that statement? Now, wait a minute, wee little man. Half's not good enough. You've got to give it all. That's not what he said. Jesus said, rather, today salvation has come to your house. Now, when Paul was writing to young Timothy, he said these words, command those who are rich in this present world. Now, what did he command them to do? Did he command the rich to sell all they had and uh, live the rest of their lives in poverty? No, that's not what he said. It goes on to say, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. So why did Jesus tell this rich young ruler that he must sell everything and give it all away? The answer is this week's rule for the road. Jesus knew there was one thing that stood in the way for this man to live a life fully devoted unto him. He knew there was one thing that was impeding this man, this rich young ruler, from following after Jesus. It wasn't the fact that he had wealth. It was really the attachment of his security blanket. That's what it was. This young man, he didn't mind being a good member of the synagogue. He didn't mind giving the, uh, God the appropriate nod each week. He didn't like, mind living according to certain moral principles. But where he drew the line was the comfort and the security that he was convinced that only his money could buy. That's why Jesus said it was difficult for those who have riches or those who trust in the riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. See, there's something about having money that causes many people to believe that money is all that matters. That is the end of itself, many believe. Now, here's a question I want to ask you. What is your security blanket? What is it that hinders you from being a fully fledged follower of Jesus? What is it that's in the way that hinders you from following passionately after Jesus? That one thing that you just can't let go of. For many, it is money. 
with a desire for money. For others, it's uh, their friends. They've got to have this group of friends. They've got to be in the in crowd. They, that, that's, who, that's where they get, they're, they're unwilling to give their friends up. For others, it's sex. For others, it's, I guess you would say, prestige. Or maybe for others, a, a kind of addiction. Or others, it might be a, a hobby or the pursuit of pleasure. What, what is your security blanket? Now, they come in all shapes and sizes, and they have one thing in common. They have convinced so many that what they offer is greater than what they'll experience fully devoted unto God. That's what those blankets convince us of. Fact is, I would say all of us have a security blanket or two. Something that's kind of in the way that stands in the way of us being committed as we know we should be. And we often think this, uh, uh, this is something I could never let go of. I just can't do that. I can't tell you how many times I've heard someone say something like this to me. Uh, I'd like to follow Jesus. I really would. But I'm afraid I could never live up to it. I would just fail. I've known many Christians who are trying to live in that never, never land of partial discipleship. They know they should be fully devoted. They know they should be sold out for Jesus. They know they should be radical as they follow Him, but they're afraid to try. They're afraid that they might just fail. And this is where today's road rule comes into play. Verse 25, Jesus said, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were uh, even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them. Think of the context. With man, it's impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. Now, the principle of believing uh, in the impossible is something that Jesus has mentioned many times before. Actually, I would say time and time again. In Mark chapter 9, he says this, Everything is possible for him who believes. What is everything? Thank you. Everything. Then in Mark chapter 11, after this, he says this, I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, Go for yourself into the sea, and does not doubt it in his heart, but believes what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, Believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And again, in today's story, he says, With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. This is what, how I can describe the Christian life. God will call you to the point of what you perceive as your impossibilities. Well, I just can't do that. That's impossible. I, I just can't. But when we get to that very moment when we say we can't, and if we take that next step, we enter into the place of the possibilities of God. But I'm afraid many of us have come to that spot where we say, oh, I, I can't take that next step. It's just impossible. It is with man. But if you're willing to take that step, you're going to experience the unlimited possibilities of God. When we hear that phrase, all things are possible with God, we often think it means this. It means that God can heal me, that, that God will meet my financial need, or he will solve this problem, or he'll change uh, my situation. Those things are true, but most significantly, as we see in the context of our story, it means that God can change you. You see... <clears throat> You can't save yourself. It's impossible. All you can do is surrender as a child, as we talked about last week. And when we surrender, there is no limit to what God can accomplish in your life. Do you really believe that? I do. 
There is no limit to what God can do in us. And for those who think, well, I could never do that, I've got a good word for you. All things are possible. For those who would say this, I, I can never change that about myself. I've got good news for you. All things are possible. You may say this, I'm just too weak to stick it out. Well, I've got good news. All things are possible. Maybe you're saying this, I can never pay that price. Well, I've got good news. All things are possible. You may be saying, well, I can never share uh, my faith with my friends. I can't do that. I've got good news. All things are possible. You may be saying this, uh, well, I just can't impact the world. Well, I've got great news. All things are possible. You may say this, there's no way our church can build a community center. Well, I've got good news. With God, all things are possible. Amen? Oh, that's weak as water. You don't believe what I said then, do you? I believe with all my heart that what Jesus said is true. It's impossible with man, but with God it is possible. The second rule for the road, all things are possible with God. All means all. No limits. All means all. Now, we know that, that one of the first verses I ever memorized in Scripture memory, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. There's that word all again. All things are possible. All things. See, our future is not determined by our weakness. It is determined by God's greatness. My friends, what, our future is not determined by what we can't do or what we can't let go of. It's determined by His power to change when we surrender that security blanket. Now, we know how the story ends. <clears throat> this rich, young ruler heard what Jesus said. His face fell, it says, and he went away sad. Now, just what if? Just play what if with you. You play what if before? Just what if? He said, okay, Jesus, I I'll go and give everything I have, everything, and I'll come follow you. What would have happened? Well, look at the text, verse 29. Jesus told the disciples, I tell you the truth. No one who has left home, brothers, sisters, mother, or father, or children, or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age and in, in, and in the age to come, eternal life. Now, is Jesus saying that if we give up our house, that we'll get a hundred more? No, he's not. What he's saying is this, whatever you surrender to God, you get back and then some. If your family rejects you for following Jesus, you will find that you are a part of the family of God, and you'll have more brothers and sisters than you know what to do with. Amen? Amen? If you give up the security blanket of your wealth, you'll find yourself living in the security of God's wealth, and he'll meet all of your needs according to his riches in glory. See, the more we give God, the more he gives back directly and indirectly. Jesus also says what we can expect. You'll get those things, and it says, with persecutions. Did Jesus say that the Christian life will be a bed of roses? Did he say it would be a cakewalk? No, he says as you surrender and give everything, you give up your security blanket, he will bless you beyond measure, but there will be persecutions. Life will be tough, and that's just true of life. Troubles will come. They'll always be there. Life is not a picnic, but following Jesus is an, advent is an adventure that can be extremely challenging. But remember the rule of the road. All things are possible. What, what is your security blanket? What is that one thing that you're under? It might be your time. I would say probably most of our security blankets are somehow crocheted to time. 
time. It could be money. That could be your security blanket. And I think what Jesus says this morning to us is, whatever that one thing is, you need to surrender it. Don't let that one thing impede you from following Jesus passionately. Maybe you're here, you say these words, you'd say, you know, I give a good impression. I'm like that rich young man. I, I come sliding in the church every Sunday, following at Jesus' feet, and saying all these flattering words, but it's just not. It's just not. We know Jesus can't be fooled. He knows the hearts. Maybe you say this, uh, you've been seduced by the lure of things and you've just abandoned your spiritual disciplines. Your priorities are all messed up. Or, or maybe you say this, I, I, God just can't forgive me. I can't even forgive myself. I, that, there's no way I, I can't do that. Well, let me tell you something, God can. God can. With Him all things are possible. Everything. I'm going to pray and I'm going to, we're going to sing a song. But whatever it is that God is, whatever that one thing is, surrender it. Follow after Him passionately. Letting nothing stand in your way as you follow after the Master. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank You so much for this story. We thank you for last week as, we, as what Jesus said that we've got to be like a little child. And a child receives a gift with enthusiasm. They receive that gift just, they couldn't buy it for themselves. And Lord, as we build on that principle, there, salvation is not a checklist of things we do. It's surrender. Salvation is impossible for us on this side. But it's possible with you. Because you gave the ultimate sacrifice in the giving of your son. Lord, I pray you would capture our attention and arrest us with that truth. And God, we would surrender today those security blankets, whatever shape, whatever size, whatever they may be, that we may follow after you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing together. <clears throat> I'm not ashamed, his thing to bear. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'll take him with me anywhere. I'll tell the world how Jesus saved me and how he gave me a life renewed. I know that if you trust him, that all he gave me, he'll give to you. I'll tell the world that he's my Savior, no other one could love me so. My life, my all, is his forever, and where he leads me. that phrase, where he leads me, I will go. When you can say that with your heart, you have surrendered your security blankets. Wherever he leads me, whatever he asks, that's what I will do. That's where I'll go. Thank you all so much for coming and certainly if you see someone who has served, is serving, or you know someone who has lost a loved one because they gave the ultimate sacrifice. They're heroes. And thank them for what they have done. Amen?
Amen? Amen. Thank you so much. All right. Anything else before we go? Anything else? Oh, yes. Miss Livy has a vacation Bible school announcement, and she is so excited to stand before all of you. So, Miss Livy, please come up here and take the microphone and uh, share with us about Bible school. <laughs> Next time, I'm praying that our night announcement will be at the beginning of the service and not at the end. <laughs> this gives me more time to be nervous. But anyway, all right, so um, you all have the opportunity uh, to help me in Vacation Bible School. Please help me in Vacation Bible School. Uh, the sign-up sheets are up. They're in the hallway across from the men's restroom, right down there. Um, the date is on uh, Sunday, June 25th through Friday, June 30th. And our theme this year is victory. And so we all um, can learn from this VBS, uh, children and adults alike. Uh, we can learn how God can give us victory every day, and we can celebrate together the victory that he's already given us um, through Jesus. And I just want to say that um, there is countless um, examples of God giving his people victory in the Bible, um, but he doesn't give them victory unless they join him on the battlefield. And so you have that opportunity coming up this summer to get off the sidelines and join the team and let's 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 see um, God do some great things um, this summer at Vacation Bible School and hopefully you'll have a video maybe next week or something and I just want to say I am cold <laughs> and I know my husband looks great like this a lot of you like him in this tie and long sleeve shirt and he looks so pretty but I guarantee you we'd be a lot more comfortable if he wore shorts <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how I follow that one up at all. We talked about Miss Libby in Sunday school this morning, and what a blessing she is to you, to our church, to our children, to our family of God. And Amen. She would be coming up about Sunday school. <laughs> about Bible school. Amen. <laughs> All right, so you have the opportunity. Bible school is approaching. And uh, there is, uh, let me tell you this, there is no greater joy than when you have a hand, so however God would use you to see a child experience the forgiveness of Jesus and follow him passionately. There is no greater joy. And we know that if we don't reach them as they, and the age is getting younger and younger. Because the world's getting such so so much more information, so much so much is changing, but we need to reach them, and we have the opportunity. It's Bible school to me is amazing uh, because the parents bring and drop them off, and we get to pour the gospel into them. Now, let me tell you, it can be challenging some t some days on Bible school, but the rewards far outweigh the challenges. And next Sunday night, what starts next Sunday night? Do you all know? Soccer camp. It starts next Sunday night. Another outreach of our church. And it, this is what happens. But when the parents bring their children to soccer camp, they don't drop them off and leave. They bring their lawn chairs. And they watch. Well, that would be an awesome place for a church member to bring their lawn chair and maybe some water and maybe some snacks and sit down beside someone and just love them because Jesus loved you. There's a challenge to each one of you. Just bring a lawn chair and be like Jesus. Amen? Yeah. All right. Anything else before we go? Anything else? If not, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Bill Wagner to close his prayer. Then we'll be dismissed. We do hope to come to make a thank you for your love, your wife's care, that you would go to the cross and pay the price for it. We pray now as we go our ways that we'll think about those that have sacrificed all that we live in a free country. And we pray that the Father that the freedom that you give us is much more precious 
And we pray, Lord, as we go, that we can tell others of you. For these things rest on our day. Amen.